Hey, thanks for tuning in this week's online message. We're uh, still in the, the James series. We are transitioning, though, from Chapter 3 into Chapter 4 here today as we, we move forward. And uh, we've been in this series on James for quite a few weeks, about eight weeks now. And today's the eighth week. And so we start with James sharing how we're, we're going to be going through trials. We're going to experience hardship in our life. And he tells us, that as we go through these trials, that we should consider it pure joy. And that's really hard for us to do sometimes, but it's this idea of considering it pure joy is because God is actually doing a work in us. And we, he says we will be overcoming these trials. We will be overcoming these things in our life. And he, he rolls right into this idea of needing to ask for wisdom, that that. When we lack it, we can ask for it, and the Lord is more than willing to give. And we talked about posturing in that time and how to ask the Lord. And then he, he leads us into the need to have our life and our deeds reflect our faith. So if we say we believe in something or that we are about something, that naturally it should come out in our, in our behavior. And so then James shows us how the tongue, our, our words and, and our attitude, the things we choose to, to relate to people is really, um, it's really a touchy thing. He says it's untamed, uh, that we use it to, to curse people at the same time as we, we try to bring life. And so we have the ability to speak life into people, or we have the ability to ultimately curse them. He talks about how it's untamable, and without the Holy Spirit uh, to help direct us, help us grab a hold of that, uh, when we're left to our will and our personal selves, then then we will be more on the cursing side than the blessing side. And so he, he talks about right after that the need to know the difference between worldly wisdom and, and godly wisdom. And that's what we talked about last week. And that really rolls into what we're talking about here in 4, how um, really we need to know what what we need to do with that once we receive that wisdom. But before we talk about what James is going to teach us here today, I want to I want you to think about your relationship with the Lord. And what I mean by, by think about your relationship, like how often do you speak with him? How often do you engage with him? How often do you hear him? How often do you seek him? Like how, how close is your relationship with the Lord? Or maybe how distant is your relationship with the Lord? And really knowing how that is. <clears throat> Excuse me, how how connected do you feel with the Lord right now? And the reason that I ask that is because I, I don't see very many people look at their relationship with the Lord in this way that I'm about to describe it. In the way that you would consider it a journey that you're on. Um, maybe in a way that, that I'm not content with the fact that that I, knowing and believing that he saved me, that I'm not content with the fact that he helped me get rid of just some sin in my life. I want to be filled with the wholeness of God. Because I think sometimes we can be, we can be just content that I said the words, I believe in my heart, I'm saved. I believe we can sometimes just be content and not move past the fact that he's helped me on this sin and he's helped me on that. Like we're missing the wholeness that God can bring to our life. And so if we're just content being the way we are, like there's a need in us that needs to surface to crave the wholeness of God in our life. And my question is, do you? Do you crave his wholeness? I mean, if, if you are content with where you are, it will be really tough. To, to really sit in what James is going to teach us today because he's talking to us about resisting worldliness in our life and embracing godliness. You know, last year I, I preached on the difference between good and godly, and this is really some of that concept that James is bringing forward. So we're going to be in James chapter 4. This will be verses 1 through 5 here today, and it says, What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire, but you do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and you fight. You do not have, because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive, because you ask with the wrong motives, 
What you may spend, what you get on your pleasures, you adulterous people. Don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity among against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think scripture says without reason that he jealously longs for the spirit that he caused to dwell in us? So when we look at this, there's really two major themes here in that bit that James is trying to walk us through. And he's talking about the conflict that is in us and the covetousness. And then he's also talking about this concept of being a friendship of the world, right? And so when we look at this first one, it's really verses 1 through 3, it talks about the conflict and covetousness. And James is addressing the root causes of conflict and quarrels in our life. He's ultimately saying this is the reason why people fight. And we will say things like, they hurt, they hurt me, they said this, they said that, they did this, they did that. And James is looking... Deeper. He's looking at the heart condition behind it, not to the act of what happened. And as you dig deeper, James says that it stems from two places. The first one is selfish desires, and the second one is our, our want to covet. And so we, we want things in this life. We want to have things, we want to hold on to some things, and then what do we do? We turn them into prayers when we want them and we don't have them. And so he's explaining to people how often we don't receive what we desire because we're asking with the wrong motives. We're asking with the wrong heart condition. We're seeking to fulfill self, like selfish or fleshly desires and pleasures, not the will of God. And so the, this goes back to when we talked about our posture the, the first week of this series and what we are asking for and, and what, what is your heart condition? When you're asking for whatever it is that's not getting an answer prayer, like what is your heart condition? What is your true intention? Because if you're, you're, when you're asking, it needs to align with what the Lord has in mind and His will. For the situation. We can know that through the scriptures. We can know what God's will is for us. And so it made me think, why would the Lord not answer maybe one of my prayers? Well, Matthew 6, 24 says, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Like that's one reason that the Lord may not answer one of my prayers. Is, is, am, I, am I trying to covet something? Am I, am I seeking something that would be more worldly and, and less godly? Is it even good for me? Is it something I have? What is the, the will of my Father in that? And then 1 John 2, 15 through 17 says, Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, Love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. And so the world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. You know, in really breaking that down, if we are seeking the Lord to bless a selfish desire, we will be rejected. If we're, we're really asking and seeking the Lord to bless something that we're trying to covet, we will be rejected. Now, here's the crazy thing about the way life really works. When I say rejected, it doesn't mean that you may not find a way to attain what it is that you've actually asked for. What it means is, is that you better enjoy it because that's the only reward you're going to get out of it. It means that you're not going to get anything stored up in heaven beyond that, meaning enjoy it because there's no blessings coming. You're not going to get any more. This was something that Jesus actually told a lot of the Pharisees, like you've received your reward. There's nothing more because you're just doing it out of yourself. And so James really takes that concept and moves into verses 4 and 5 on this idea of friendship with the world. Because if you're going to covet things, and if you're going to, to seek those things, and you're going to have these conflicts, like you, you're trying to be a friend of the world, not the friend of the Lord. It doesn't, it doesn't compute. It doesn't align with the will of our Father. He's emphasizing that friendship with the world is an enmity with God. An enemy is defined as a state or a feeling of, of being actively opposed or hostile to someone or something. That's the dictionary version. 
That's a worldly definition, but the biblically, it's it's more than that. Because when we read that scripture, like James likened it to spiritual adultery. Like none of us, none of us are about adultery. We know adultery is sin. We know that adultery is not something to be. And he is saying that when we are friends with the world, it is like us cheating on God. And the Greek meaning behind it here actually means a deep-rooted hatred. And so it's meaning that our life that is worldly are things that we are hatefully waging war against God with. And so remember last week on wisdom, we talked about wisdom being such a thing. We are called to what? Purity. To overcome, to purge those things out of our life. And that's important because here James warns us that those who choose to align with the worldly values become literally enemies of God. And I don't want to be an enemy of the Lord. That's why when we accept Christ, that we should devote ourselves to purifying our thoughts, our attitudes, and our behavior. And this is what it means to clothe yourself in Christ, that we are, we are adopting and, and changing our life to reflect the character and the characteristics of Jesus. But we have challenges in this. The world challenges with materialism and consumerism, social media and comparison, comparing myself with everything under the sun, moral relativism. Like we need to resist the world. That's how we purify. That's how we overcome. When James talked about here in four, he said he calls Christians to recognize this danger of being too friendly with the world. We cannot be a devoted follower of Christ and look just like the world speak just like the world think just like the world because you will not be devoted to christ you will be divided in those things you'll be at war colossians 3 encourages us to actually really set our minds on things above right and they prioritize our relationship with god or over worldly pursuits pursuing godliness now in our life is by seeking god's will and aligning our desires with his will with his desires and with us seeking his satisfaction to receive peace. And we can do that in our prayer time, in our reading time, in, in identifying things in our life and working on making them disappear and purifying those places in our life, focusing on the things that the Lord would have us on, the things above. Fellowship with other believers brings really great accountability in this. And that is really a vital, vital process and pursuing in our life would be good godly friends you know john wesley says do all the good you can by all the means you can in all the ways you can in all the places you can at all the times you can to all the people you can as long as ever you can like there's no reason to stop and as we we change our life and reflect it for more like christ what was jesus always for he was always doing what was best, wanting best, encouraging what's best all the time in anyone and everyone. C.S. Lewis said, aim at heaven and you will get earth thrown in. Aim at earth and you will get neither. So it's very important for us to understand that even though a few weeks ago we talked about the tongue, last week we talked about wisdom, we talked about the warnings James giving us in conflict and covetousness and and, and really being friends with the world, he's leading us into James 4, 6 through 10 here. And he says, but he gives us more grace. So it means there's hope for us. It means it's not over. That means we have this thing. He says, but he gives us more grace. That is why scripture says, God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. Now, a lot of people are like, see, Christianity isn't fun. It isn't all these fulfilling things. It isn't all this. What he's saying is, is recognize the sin and worldliness in you, and you need to change it. Because you have sinned against the Lord, it should create something inside of you that you need to mourn. Because in your repentance and asking of forgiveness or your confession, there has to be the step 
of being able to seek reconciliation for the sake of restoration, which only comes from a change of heart, which means you will not change your heart until you realize what you've done. And so it's part of purifying our life. And so despite our human failings, God still offers more grace. And God's grace is connected to our humility here, right? So James is quoting really Proverbs, and he's telling us that God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble, right? And so when we look at that, he's calling believers to submit to God. Do you do that? He's calling us to resist the devil. Do you truly resist the devil, or do you think nothing of him? Do you think maybe that little thing's not that big a deal, or maybe this doesn't really have a hold on me, or maybe this really isn't hurting me or others? when it is, because the trick has been the whisper that it's not really all that big deal. So do you truly resist the devil? And do you draw near to God? Now this is why when I meet with people who are oftentimes struggling, the first question I always ask them is, how is your relationship with the Lord right now? Because most of them don't realize that they've actually distanced themselves. They have quit talking to the Lord. They quit going through devotions. They quit reading their Bible. They quit seeking him. They quit looking for his approval in their life and like purifying things. And most people get to a place of realization how far they've distanced themselves and isolated themselves from the Lord. And so if they're not drawing near to him, they are drawing near to the world and to the devil himself. But we can draw near again. It involves repentance, humility, and a contrary heart. We have to be willing to genuinely and sincerely lay it all at the foot of the cross. And we have to be careful in that. Because as we continue to friendship with the world, as we continue to go down this rabbit hole, he talks about in, in, in the rest of 11 and 12, this judging others that he talks about. And James warns against speaking evil and judging others. This is where the life and death comes from out of the tongue. We can speak life or we can curse. We can be double-minded by, by praising the Lord and talking terrible about his very own creation, other people. You know, God's role is the only law-giving and judge. We are not the judge, jury, and executioner. The Lord is. He highlights judging others as the same as if we were to choose to judge the law, right? And only God has the authority to save and to destroy. That's not our role. And so we need to be very, very careful where we're at. First Peter 5, 6 and 7 says, Humble yourselves, therefore under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Philippians 2, 3 through 4 says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. See, you can't have, you can't have pride and devote yourself to something else. It's, it's two different things. So when we talked last week, not being able to pick up our cross unless we deny ourselves, you must deny the earthly things. You must deny the flesh. You must deny the worldly wisdom. But we have challenges in that, and pride is the number one. See, humility is often considered a weakness in our culture and in this world, and the temptation to rely solely on one's abilities and really resources can lead to a lack of dependence on God. We have to understand our dependence on the Lord. Uh, St. Augustine said one of the scariest lines I've ever heard. He says, it was pride that changed angels into devils. It is humility that makes men as angels. And so he, he's saying that pride is the whole reason that someone that went from one of God's greatest angels became one of his greatest enemies as the devil. And if we are friends in the world, then we become the same. We do not want to be friends with the world. We want to purify our thoughts, our attitudes, our words, and our heart to seek the goodness of what's above. And, and, and we have to fight against 
our busyness and our distractions. You know, this fast-paced modern life can leave very little room for us to have this quiet reflection. And I tell you what, there's sometimes people will get up and they're like, yep, I read my Bible, I prayed, I'm good. And then God doesn't enter the equation the rest of the day. He can't do that. And it has to be a genuine seeking of God's presence and then being in tune to what the Lord would have us throughout our day. This constant noise and activity that comes into our lives that we allow can actually draw us out of that still, small voice. And we want to fight for that. And we fight for that by submitting to the Lord. You know, true humility involves recognizing our need for God and yielding to his authority. Now, there's a lot of times we'll recognize God's, but we don't always yield to his will. That takes submission. And that's a choice that not everybody likes to make. This means trusting him in all aspects of our lives. It means seeking his guidance in our decisions. Do you do that? And then do you walk out the answer that he gave you? You know, the other thing is, is resisting the devil is what James talked about. He reminds us resisting the devil involves standing firm in our faith. And the only way we're going to stand firm is to increase our trust that the Lord is who he is. And rejecting the temptations that come to our life, which is how we purify our life and lead us to the Lord rather than away because as James says as we draw near to him he will draw near to us we are called to draw near and we can trust that he will draw near because we have I want to leave you on this one last quote from Mother Teresa which I think really sums things up because we we came out of all this tongue talk and how how that can become a life force or a life taker into the need of what true wisdom is, true godly wisdom. It's not success, it's not titles, it's not money, it's not all of these things. It's, it's purity that leads to peace, that leads to righteousness. And today, we can see that that peace and that righteousness is destroyed through conflict and covetousness, through friends with the world rather than seeking the godliness of our life. And Mother Teresa says it best that if we're gonna overcome, it comes with humbleness. She says, if you are humble, nothing will touch you, neither praise nor disgrace, because you know what you are. And that's a really bold statement. Do you know what you are as a child of God? And that's my prayer for you, that you recognize that, that you chase the path of the purity so that you can have peace and righteousness in your life. So Heavenly Father, we come to you here today just in awe of your hand in our life, in the life of this place. Lord, I am so thankful that you are God. And Lord, we praise you and we, we have reverence for you, Lord, because you are God. And Lord, I don't want my relationship to be content because I know that you have rescued me. I do not want my relationship to be content with you because you've helped me overcome a little bit of sin. Lord, I crave the wholeness of of our relationship. So Lord, help me draw near to you so that you can draw near to me. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thanks for tuning in this week. I hope that you tune in next week as well. We have a special treat here in that, and I'll explain more next time. We'll see you then.